Welcome everyone to the Reformed Confessional Podcast. My name is John Fry and it is July 2023. As always, Reformed Confessional exists to promote Reformed Confessionalism, to proclaim the sufficiency of Scripture, and to extol the supremacy of Christ over all things. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today as we continue in our present series, Getting to Know Our Great God. If you are a regular listener, you've picked up with us in episode 11, Getting to Know Our Great God, where we examine the works of both John Calvin and Augustine, and took note that each of those works began with a discussion about the knowledge of God. So our goal is that we would come to the right knowledge of God so that we would come to live a life that displays the right worship of God. Getting to know God and worshiping Him according to that knowledge. To do that, we're utilizing the Westminster Larger Catechism, as always, shout out to the Westminster Larger, as a guide to help us get to know our great God. And then in episode 12, we began developing some of that knowledge by answering the first part of Westminster Larger Catechism, question 7, that states God is a spirit. We discussed the difference in saying God is spirit and God is a spirit. We also discussed a little bit of the biblical basis, John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, and the context, including the historical context around that statement in John chapter 4, verse 24. To do that, we dove in, we utilized resources like John Calvin, like Pastor John MacArthur, like ancient Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, and we took a look at the systematic theology of Louis Burkhoff, and we'll do that again today. Like I mentioned, we're utilizing the Westminster Larger Catechism question 7 that states, what is God? And so, and continuing on, we'll go ahead and read the answer to that question in its entirety and then specify on the content of today's episode. So Westminster Larger Catechism, question 7 states, What is God? Answer. God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection, all-sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. So let's settle in, and today we're going to get to know our great God through examining this statement here in this answer we just read, in and of himself, infinite. As I mentioned, we'll utilize Louis Burkhoff, who gives us a really good functional definition. So when we're referring to the infinity or infinitude of God, we're going to utilize Burkhoff's definition so that you know what I'm talking about each time we reference that. So here's what Burkhoff writes in his systematic theology regarding God's infinitude. He says, quote, The infinity of God is that perfection of God by which he is free from all limitations. In ascribing it to God, we deny that there are or can be any limitations to the divine being or attributes. It implies that he is in no way limited by the universe, by this time-space world, or confined to the universe. It does not involve his identity with the sum total of existing things, nor does it exclude the coexistence of derived and finite things, to which he bears relation. We distinguish various aspects of God's infinity. So let's break that down. Here is our definition we'll be utilizing. When we say that God is infinite, when we quote the Westminster Larger Catechism question 7 answer, and it says, in and of himself infinite, what we mean and Burkhoff gives us a great definition, is that God is free from all limitations. He's free from all limitations. A portion of Burkhoff's Sestio that I just read to you, I want to just break that down and ensure that we grasp what was said there before we move on and look at the biblical basis for Burkhoff's statements. He says in ascribing it to God, the fact that he cannot be limited, he's free from all limitations, we deny that there are or can be any limitations to the divine being or attributes which is very interesting because as we live our lives daily, everything has limits on it, whether it be money, the length of the road, the time left on the alarm clock when we're asleep, the dimensions of the bed that we lay in. What I keep thinking studying for this is units of measurement. You cannot place a unit of measurement on God. We look at time, we look at distance, we measure these things out, And there are limits. Lately, my wife and I have been examining our property line where there's been surveyors come out for the county and they've taken great care to place the limit between where we live and where our neighbor lives. 
And these limits for us are very helpful. However, you can't place the same limits on God. And so, again, when we say God is infinite, we are saying he is free from all limitations. Those observations I just shared with you, to me, show that God is just different than us. He is holy. He is other. Where we, in our being, are limited, but also as we interact horizontally with other human beings, with other men and women, limitations define a lot of what we do, but not our great God. Another reason to worship him for just being simply far greater and different than we are. The next statement Burkhoff made says, quote, it implies that he is in no way limited by the universe, by this time-space world, or confined to the universe. In short, God is outside of time and space, which we will look at the biblical basis for such a statement as well. And then lastly, what Burkhoff said here is, quote, it does not involve his identity with the sum total of existing things, nor does it exclude the coexistence of derived and finite things to which he bears relation. So the first part of that denies that God can simply be numbered among the sum total of that which exists in heaven and on earth. However, his infinitude does not cause him to be so transcendent that he cannot be in relation with those who are numbered among the heavens and the earth, to which someone like me and you ought to say amen and worship God, that the one who has no limits and exists outside of time and space can be and would still be in relationship with us. For that we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. So hopefully that breakdown helps you understand a little bit more of what it means that God is infinite. But I'll repeat it several times throughout this episode. The infinity of God is that perfection of God by which he is free from all limitations. So oftentimes, as I'm reading throughout the confessions or great folks like Burkhoff, we come across statements like this. What I've tried to train myself to do is say, hey, what is the biblical basis for this? How is it that someone can make this, this claim and it be in accordance with God's holy, inspired, infallible word. So applying that question to Burkhoff's claim that when we say God is infinite, we mean that he is free from all limitations, we find a passage like Job chapter 11. Also, if you look at the Westminster Larger Catechism, many publications of that state the answer to each question, but also have scripture references. And Job chapter 11 beginning with verse 7, is listed right there on question 7. What we're going to do for the rest of the episode today, now that we have a good definition from Burkhoff and a better feel for what it means that God is infinite or that he is free from all limitations, we're going to examine the biblical basis through the lens of Job and specifically his friend Zophar. I'd venture to say that most listeners are familiar with the tragedy of Job's life. If you read Job chapter 1, specifically verses 13 through 22, you'll see that Job, in a short amount of time, loses his oxen, donkeys, sheep, camels, his servants, and his children. And then after this, following Job's losses, he suffers in his body. And if all of this is not enough, his wife approaches him, and in Job chapter 2 verse 9 says, Quote, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And you've got to respect Job's response. He says, quote, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? That part of the story I'm convinced most folks are familiar with. And Job, we know, is quoted within those first couple chapters saying, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, following chapter 2, I don't know what folks' level of familiarity is with this. However, we'll summarize maybe chapters 3 through 10 and then read a portion of chapter 11 together. Following Job's tragedy, his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, share a dialogue with Job regarding his suffering. Now, from chapters 3 through 10, it basically goes like this. Job talks, Eliphaz talks. Job replies to Eliphaz, then Bildad talks to Job. Job replies again to Bildad. Basically, what's going on is Job is maintaining his innocence where his friends are telling him, look, tragedy happens to those who have sinned. Or another way to say it is that innocent folks, they prosper. Bildad even goes as far as to ask Job to repent. But then finally, after Eliphaz and Bildad get their turn to tell Job such things, 
Zophar gets his turn. And Zophar's first words to Job are recorded in Job chapter 11. So I'm going to read to you Job chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now remember, when we're answering the question about what is God, and we say that he is infinite, the biblical basis is found right here in Job chapter 11. Specifically, we're going to zoom in on verse 7. Here's the context. Job chapter 11, verse 1. Then Zophar, the Namathite, answered and said, Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and a man full of talk be judged right? Should your babble silence men, and when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for he is manifold in understanding. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Can you find the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. And there it is, Job chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. So does this text support the notion that God is infinite? And I'd say the rhetorical questions in verse 7 require us to answer, yes, it does teach that God is infinite. The question specifically in verse 7, Zophar asks Job, can you find out the deep things of God? And he says, also, can you find out the limit of the Almighty? The rhetorical answer would be, no, of course. What Zophar is relaying to Job is that God is limitless. He's saying God is higher than the heaven, deeper than Sheol. Its measure is longer than the earth. Again, he's getting at there is something to God and you cannot find out his depth or his limit. Or remember all those units of measure I mentioned earlier. Verse 9 says its measure is longer than the earth. It's beyond what can be quantified. This is the God that we are talking about here. With that, I want to dissect Zophar's statement because Job is really interesting in the fact that the friends say a lot of really sound doctrinal-based statements, just not so much at the appropriate time. So I want to take a look at the good and at the bad of Zophar's statement. To do that, we're going to take a look at Matthew Henry's commentary, because Matthew Henry points out the good. So first, the good of Zophar's statement that we just read. Here's what Matthew Henry says, quote, Zophar speaks well concerning God and his greatness and glory, concerning man and his vanity and folly. So from Henry's perspective, Zophar's theology proper and anthropology are spot on. If I could go back and examine Calvin's Institutes from episode 11 of this podcast, I think what Zophar does in verse 8 is a really great example of what Calvin talks about in his Institutes, book 1, chapter 1, section 1. There, Calvin says, quote, The infinitude of good which resides in God becomes more apparent from our poverty. And that's exactly what Zophar does. Zophar highlights God's infinitude, and in doing so, he exposes Job's finiteness and limitations. So when when Zophar asks Job, what can you do? What can you know? He exposes Job's limitations compared to God's infinitude, in which he does all things according to his will, and God knows all things. And that's what Matthew Henry is pointing out, that Zophar speaks really well concerning God, and concerning man, specifically God's greatness and glory, and in comparison, man's vanity and folly. And this develops what Calvin is saying. Anytime you hold self up against God, you are left seeing the infinitude of good, which comparatively, we're left with our own poverty. And this causes us to see our great need for God. So Zophar accomplishes this well. His doctrine seems to be right on point. However, We've utilized Matthew Henry to look at the good in Zophar. I'm very thankful for his work. Now, we're going to utilize some biblical counseling material to look at the bad of what Zophar says. Because although Zophar's doctrine is sound, his application of that doctrine is off. The Association of Certified Biblical Counselors has a weekly podcast I would certainly recommend to you titled Truth in Love. And one of my favorite episodes is titled How Not to Counsel, Learning from Job's Friends. And so in this episode, Dr. Dale Johnson and Pastor Brad Brandt discuss 15 indicators of poor biblical counseling. So we've been looking at Zophar in Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 9 primarily, but within their podcast episode, Pastor Brad Brandt discusses the next few verses in Job chapter 11. So it's following, I think it's verse 11 through maybe 13 whereabouts. But regarding Zophar's counsel overall to Job, he says, quote, that's wonderful counsel 
for someone who is in belligerent sin. You need to put off your sin and God will bless you. It is not at all appropriate for this man who's suffering. And it's not because of unrighteousness, we're told. They had an inadequate view of suffering. So in this critique, I think Pastor Brad Brandt captures the downside of Zophar's statements in Job chapter 11. His statements are the right doctrine misapplied. Certainly, in God's infinitude, he knows Job's sin. The problem is Job's not suffering because of his sin. It's interesting to me that Zophar appeals to the limitlessness of God to try to correct Job. He's like, hey, God knows all things, but really, Zophar should have been applying such doctrine to himself. Yes, Zophar, God knows all things, but you do not. And sometimes people suffer for reasons other than personal sin, the sin of Adam, the sin of others. But we'll leave Job and his three friends here with this note, that it is great that we know wonderful doctrine. But I hope that as we've looked at Job, we can learn a secondary lesson besides getting to know our great God, that as we seek to counsel and comfort and teach and preach to those in our life, that we wouldn't just tout sound doctrine, but we would share it at appropriate times for appropriate applications. And that can be quite a difficulty indeed. So we'll continue on as we conclude with, yes, we are taught God's infinitude with the exchange in Job chapter 11, where specifically Zophar asks, Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? Well, no, we can't because, like Burkhoff said, he is free from all limitations. So lastly, from the book of Job, we'll leave the three friends there. But what I want to do is take a look at God's response to Job at the end of his trials, because this is vital for establishing the fact that God is infinite. So our Lord says to Job in chapter 38, verses 4 through 5, quote, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Now, the Lord continues on more in chapter 38, but I wanted to look at verses 4 and 5 specifically because when you take verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You couple that with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This shows us that God is outside of time, and that's something that Burkhoff had mentioned. He said that God is no way limited by the universe, and he went on to summarize that and say, by this time-space world. Well, right here, God is showing that he is outside of time, something that really structures our life, something that we seem to be very dependent on, is something that God exists outside of. And he provides that declaration when he asks, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Even look at the word when. When is a statement regarding time. He asked Job two questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation? Well, Job wasn't there. He wasn't around because he didn't exist back then. Showing Job, you have a finite beginning. You are not infinite. But also the word when takes us back to time. Well, before time began, when the earth was void and without form, God was there. So he is not limited by eternity past as Job is, as we are. But then in verse 5, God asks, who determined the earth's measurements? This teaches us that God is not limited by space. So this would be the biblical reasoning for saying, like Burkhoff, that God is not limited by this time-space world. He is not on the scale of time and space that we are. Where were you when I laid the measurements of the world, when I determined the earth's measurements? Well, if you are the carpenter, if you are the builder, and you have the tape measure, and you're fighting through the saw dust, and you set your miter saw to the side, and you're taking your pencil and making marks, you are establishing that you are outside of that which you are measuring. You are not subject. Say that you frame your work together. You finish it. You drill it. You've got it ready to go. You exist outside of that which you created the measurements for, and that is a very small way that my mind tries to grasp that God is external and outside and beyond and not limited to that which he measures, that which he creates. So Job chapter 38 verses 4 and 5 from the very mouth of Yahweh, there's an anthropomorphism for you, we see that he is outside of time and he is outside of space. Last, I want to share this with you. Have you ever tried to meditate on how long forever is? 
Have you ever done that mental experiment thing of thinking, you know, when I die, I'll go, I will go to heaven, I will live forever and ever and ever and ever. And in doing that, it's really removing the limit of time that we are so accustomed to. Have you ever thought about that? And and maybe you don't know what I'm talking about, but when I do this mental exercise, I quickly become overwhelmed in my spirit with the inability to grasp that it just keeps going. I'm so accustomed to placing a limit on time that the thought of eternity never ending, it's elusive to me in a way. It makes me shudder. And similar thoughts come over me when I do the mental experiment of, you know, thinking of overcoming Earth's atmosphere and traveling through the heavens. Just if I went straight up and got to the expanse and the darkness of the night and the stars, the vastness of the universe, there I am going off in space and All I want to do when I think about that is put my feet back on the soil of the earth. These two types of things, I don't know, some of you may be listening like, I've never done that, I don't know what you're talking about, John. But for me, when I do these two things, they bring quickly to me in a way that's difficult to describe my finiteness, that I am bound by time to the point that my mind shudders and quakes because I can't grasp forever and ever and ever and ever. I can't grasp that eternity. I can't really understand that our spirit and then when we receive a new body will live forever i can't grasp that it kind of makes me do almost like a whole body chill and snap out of it i can't comprehend that and in sharing that with you what i'm relaying is that slightly overwhelming feeling of realizing your finitude during these mental exercises where we try to grasp and go beyond the limits of time and space that our eternal soul will in my opinion when I can realize my finitude. That hints at the essence of what it means to say that God is infinite. By doing those mental exercises, I can grasp that I am finite. And then it causes me to worship God because, kind of like Calvin said, when we grasp God's infinity, his goodness, we are left with our poverty. And in doing those mental exercises, it just continues to reveal my poverty compared to God's glory and the fact that he is infinite And there are no limits placed upon him. So before we sign off, I hope that gives you a little bit of a feel for God is infinite. He is free from all limitations. And I wanted to share with you in the last part of Burkhoff's quote, he said that, quote, we distinguish various aspects of God's infinity. And this statement is also seen in the Westminster Larger Catechism, question seven, which states God is infinite or free from all limitations, specifically in being glory, blessedness, and perfection. So now that we understand some of the biblically derived material that supports the statement that God is infinite, by looking at Job and Zophar's right doctrine at the wrong time, God's declaration that shows us he's outside of time and space. Next time we come together, we'll discuss those four aspects of God's infinity, that he's infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection. Until then, I hope you take such knowledge that God is spirit and that he is infinite. And you take that knowledge, worship him rightly in spirit, in truth, knowing that he has no limitations placed upon him. Please remember that you can visit us at our website where there is new content released every Friday for the glory of our Savior at reformconfess.com. God bless you, and we will see you next time.